Welcome to Friday's edition of COVID-19. It looks like we're ending the work week on the 700 level as cluster infections continue across daily settings. And against that backdrop, health experts debate the issue of COVID-19 vaccination for children. We have more on that debate later on in the program. Here first are the pandemic updates with Alkwon Suwa. So there's been another surge in cases here in Korea. Yes, Sunny, by around 30 cases compared to yesterday. And with that, Korea reported its highly single day figure in more than two weeks as 747 infections were reported this Friday as of 12 a.m. And with that, the number of domestic transmissions has also risen to above the 700s. Now, for two straight days, we are on the 700 level. And with that, the average number of cases in the past week stands in the 600s with the average for domestic cases in the high 500s and the total number of cases in Korea has surpassed 130,000. Now this Friday over 40 percent of infections have occurred outside the metropolitan region and a new concern here in Jeollanam-do province with 50 new infections this due to a cluster infection linked to a nightclub and now officials have decided to have stronger inspections at nightlife entertainment venues as well as PCR tests every week for people working at such facilities. Now, meanwhile, newly appointed Prime Minister Kim Bu gyum on his first day in office said his priority is to turn the COVID-19 situation to a manageable level by the second half of the year. Here's more. Instead of rigidly upgrading our social distancing level and imposing more business restrictions, the government will shift its focus to on-site enforcement of prevention rules. If the situation stabilizes in the first half of the year, we will be able to transition to our new social distancing scheme in July and take another step closer to normality. Right, and speak of normality, one path to that destination, I believe, is vaccination. What is the latest on that front? Well, Sunny, beginning this Friday, people who have been receiving the AstraZeneca shot since the end of February are now getting their second shot. So some 926,000 people are subject to the second dose in May and June. So we are expecting the number here that we're seeing to go up faster now in the near future. Now, meanwhile, in the U.S., the CDC on Thursday announced new public recommendations uh, that say fully vaccinated people won't have to wear protest protective face masks, that is, in most settings, so even indoors. Uh, but caution is still advised when it comes to places that are very crowded. Now, let's take a look at the global figures. The U.S. has a total of 33.6 million cases, followed by India, which hit 24 million with over 340,000 new infections reported in just a day. Let's move over to the UK. Uh, the UK is aiming to fasten inoculation of people for their second uh, shot of vaccination because the Indian variant has made its way to the UK. So now the UK is seeing again a rise in cases at some 2,600 infections reported in the past day. And the total number of infections around the world stands at 161.8 million. Those are the updates I have for now, but I'll see you back after the government briefing. Sunny? All right, so I uh, thank you for now. Right, earlier on Thursday, health officials here hosted a detailed press session on the country's vaccination progress and its related impact. I have Kim sung here in the studio with details on that. Welcome, sung Good afternoon, Sunny. Right then, let's start with that session. Right, so the government did hold a session, a Q&A session to talk in depth about a variety of issues. And to do this, the government brought in a few experts to share their views and opinions regarding a number of questions related to vaccines. Now, they took the opportunity to underscore the importance of getting vaccinated, especially in people aged 60 and above. Health authorities noted that the majority of COVID-related deaths were reported among in the elderly, which is why the government is continuing to prioritize vaccinations vaccinations for senior citizens above the age of 60. Those above the age of 60 took up one quarter of all COVID-19 cases in the country, but accounted for 95% of all deaths from the disease. COVID-19 poses a serious risk to senior citizens and those with underlying health conditions. 
The KDCA said that vaccinations are very effective in reducing the death rate as well as the rate of transmissions. Moreover, it said even a single dose was 89.5% effective in preventing new infections. Also, not one death has been reported among vaccinated individuals who contracted COVID-19. Although preliminary, the KDCA thus said it represents a 100% prevention rate in fatalities up to this point. I see, which is why authorities, I understand, are encouraging people with pre-existing health conditions to also seek vaccination. That's correct. So people with underlying conditions had raised the question and experts were answering, yes, indeed, the vaccination for these kinds of people is indeed important. Uh, the recommendation also comes as the rate of vaccine uptake is not as high as the government would like one week after the start of vaccinations for people above the age of 70. The experts at Thursday's briefing said those with underlying conditions should and must get vaccinated precisely due to their health status. Vaccine bookings for people aged 70 to 74 began on May 6th, so it's been over a week now, and registration for those aged between 65 and 69 began Monday. Authorities noted in Thursday's briefing that just over half of those newly eligible have made their vaccine appointments. Although registration will be open up uh, until June 3rd, the rate of current uptake is comparatively lower than recent survey results showing that 86% of people aged 75 and above were willing to get vaccinated. In the Q&A session Thursday afternoon, questions were also raised on whether vaccines are safe for people with underlying health conditions such as high blood pressure or diabetes. The experts said that unless the cases are very severe, they are all encouraged to get their shots. I think we can say that there are no underlying conditions that exclude anyone from COVID-19 vaccines developed so far. In fact, it's all the more important to get vaccinated if you have a chronic illness, unless you are undergoing an aggressive treatment program. The government said adverse reactions were reported in only 0.2% of people in their 60s who got their vaccines, a rate that is similar to those in other age groups. With that, health authorities once again encouraged all members of the public to get vaccinated, citing the lower risk of death, transmissions and serious illnesses. Right. I understand the government also touched upon the issue of compensation for post-inoculation mm -hmm. problems. Right. The, the KDCA Commissioner Chung and Gung uh, talked in depth about this uh, in Thursday's afternoon briefing and indicated that the government would broaden the scope of its compensation program indeed. Once the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Committee has reviewed a case and identified a causal link to the vaccines, all medical expenses, including the cost of diagnosis, treatment and care as well as other reimbursements will be provided by the government. The government has decided to provide reimbursements even in the case of minor side effects involving COVID-19 vaccines that incur out-of-pocket expenses of less than 300,000 Korean won. The government will cover the medical cost of all side effects, even those involving small sums to treat mild after effects. Even in cases with no clear links to the vaccines due to the lack of evidence or otherwise, those suffering from serious illnesses after getting vaccinated will be eligible to receive up to 10 million Korean won or roughly 9,000 U.S. dollars to pay for their medical bills. The new measure is still in the process of being rolled out and will be formally adopted around next week. All right, Songyun, as always, thank you very much for the coverage. Thank you for having me. Right, it's time now for the regular briefing on the COVID-19 situation here in Korea for this Friday. The rain is in the forecast for Korea this weekend, so do refrain from non-essential outings. But should you choose to venture outdoors, do remember to have your face masks on at all times and to limit your time within indoor settings given the risk of COVID-19 transmission in the absence of proper and frequent ventilation and speak of ventilation. Do remember to allow for a healthy and regular circulation of fresh air when at home as well. Now we're still waiting for the briefing to start, so here are a few words related to possible discomforts after COVID-19 vaccination. First then, feeling uncomfortable for up to 48 hours post-inoculation is said to be normal. This is reportedly one indication that the vaccine is working. Common side effects include pain at the site of injection, fatigue and headaches. So secondly, with regard to ways to minimize discomfort, here are a few natural remedies. 
Try applying a cold cloth or pack on the injection site or try gently moving your vaccinated arm to stimulate blood flow to dispense the local area of inflammation. For those suffering from fatigue, get some rest. For fever, drink plenty of water. The briefing is about to start. We'll come back to you afterwards. 네, 안녕하십니까. 질병관리청 예방접종 대응 추진단 uh, We will be beginning our briefing. I am the head of the uh, vaccination center here at the Central Disaster Safety Countermeasures Headquarters. And today we have our, uh, Deputy Director Kwon Jun with the briefing. As for the Q&A sessions, we are also joined by other team members of the respective team. We also have a sign language translation available for you. First of all, here is Mr. Kwon Jun with the explanation on today's briefing. 안녕하십니까. 권준욱 국립보건연구원. I am Kwon Junuk, and let us now begin our regular briefing for May 14th, Friday. First of all, as for the COVID-19 vaccinations, uh, from yesterday we have begun uh, the booking for vaccine appointments uh, between the age of 60 and 64. And on the first day of such booking, we have had over 730,000. And yesterday alone, we had about 1.12 uh, million and people, senior citizens who have made their bookings. And we are seeing since the uh, 6th of uh, uh, May and during the past week, we have uh, about 54.9% of the senior citizens who have completed their bookings. And starting from yesterday, we are receiving the uh, uh, bookings for the age group of 60 to 64. And all of the people starting from 62 to uh, uh, to 74, they can also make their bookings right now. And as for the caregivers and teachers uh, for the uh, preschools and kindergartens, as well as primary schools, we have more than 40% of them completing the booking process as well. And all of them, they will be administered with the AstraZeneca vaccines. And we ha have seen uh, that the uh, COVID-19 is fatal to the uh, senior citizens, which can result in an average death of five per every uh, 100. However, the uh, serious uh, blood clots that may accompany uh, the vaccinations is uh, very low. Uh, and therefore, we say that the benefits of vaccination outweighs uh, the risks of side effects. And we are also having the online uh, registration of the uh, vaccine appointments uh, via uh, online, uh, 24 hours, that is. Uh, and we uh, children can do so for your um, elder parents as well. So we ask the children of your senior parents to help them uh, get the booking uh, process as well through the online process. And also you could do so uh, offline uh, by designated hospitals and also by visiting the local health community centers as well. And the AstraZeneca vaccines, especially for the recipients of the first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccines, we will be having the AstraZeneca vaccines second shots to be delivered starting from today to the respective hospitals. Uh, currently, we are also having the first uh, first dose administration for uh, those uh, be uh, beginning uh, from the age of 60 to other senior citizens, and we are also making sure that these vaccines doses are distributed nationwide to the hospital so that they can uh, get their vaccine starting from the 27th. And as for the senior citizens above the age of 65, as we roll out these vaccines in full-fledged starting from May 27th, uh, making sure that we do not have any uh, vaccine doses that go in waste, we are also planning to have a special system uh, where we could utilize uh, the uh, leftover vaccines uh, due to uh, the no-show of the reservations. And we will be cooperating with uh, many uh, private sectors uh, like Naver, Cacao, or so forth. And we will make sure that these um, no-show um, reservations, information of these areas will also be uploaded on these uh, portal websites. And uh, we'll have greater access for the people uh, to know where uh, these vaccines are available, especially near their neighborhood, so that they can take use of the vaccines, uh, making sure that they have more uh, convenience. 
convenience. And also, we will also uh, minimize the amount of vaccines that will go into waste. And nextly, uh, on a global level, we are seeing a COVID-19 emergence uh, continue. And here are some updates. Globally, we are seeing a new uh, weekly tallies, which has been a slight decline from the last uh, week. However, we are seeing continued uptick in the number of cases in Southeast Asia. And we have seen about 5.5 million cases uh, this uh, week, past week, between uh, past week compared to the previous week. It was a slight decline. However, centering around India as well as Southeast Asian countries, we are seeing continued resurgence of the virus and increase of fatalities as well. And as mentioned in India, we have seen over one uh, 400,000 daily cases. And in Nepal as well, we have seen a surge in the um, cases and fatalities with over 76, uh, 79 percent rise in daily infections. And on the other hand, in countries that are um, rolling out their vaccines in full fledged, they are seeing a large decline of the uh, infections. And in Israel and UK and the US, which has over 45 percent vaccination rate, they are also seeing a cl uh, clear decline of the new cases. And also in many European countries uh, whose uh, vaccination rate hovers around 25 percent, like Germany, they are also seeing a slow decline of the cases. To this end, the Korean government will also exert our full efforts to roll out the vaccines. And now we also have the updates for the critically ill uh, patients as for COVID-19, uh, starting from February and uh, April. And we have seen after the uh, peak, it peaked in November, we have seen uh, that this has been a steady decline uh, and it reached about 2.7 percent. And in April, we have seen a temporarily, uh, we, has, uh, we have seen a slight increase in the uh, proportion of critically ill patients. And as for the fatalities, we also see continued uh, decline in the fatalities, which hover around 0 0.63 percent uh, here in uh, April as well, while the figure is tentative. And also, uh, lately, we are seeing a surge, a, a slight increase in the number of um, fatalities, as well as also uh, the uh, proportion of critical ill patients in the uh, few weeks of April. However, we see uh, that this has been attributable to uh, the uh, large infections of uh, cluster infections at senior citizens' uh, welfare facilities. And during the past months, we have seen a uh, continued days of our daily tally hovering uh, more than uh, above the 400 mark. For, uh, however, we are able to see a clear decline of these um, proportion of critical ill patients and uh, fatalities. This means that we ha were able to contain the virus to a large extent. However, in late April, we have seen a slight uptick and a rebound in the number of uh, critically ill patients and fatalities. And we believe that this could also be implicated in the month of May. And as mentioned before, we say that this uptick is related slightly to uh, the cluster infections at uh, the uh, senior citizens' welfare facilities. And therefore, to this end, we believe that vaccinating uh, senior citizens is ever more important. And going forward, the quarantine authorities will also have an in-depth uh, analysis and assessment of the critically ill patients of COVID-19. We will also have continued monitoring of the uh, treatments and therapeutics that are being rolled out here in the country. And nextly, as for the R&D uh, aspects, we have seen in the U.S., New York and the U.K., Nigeria, as well as these um, new variants. Uh, we have seen uh, the efficacy of these new variants of the uh, COVID-19 COVID therapeutics against these uh, uh, new variants. We have carried out three large phases of the analysis. As for the U.S. New York variant and the new U.K. and Nigerian variants, we have seen uh, that the efficacy rate has decreased slightly. However, uh, these therapeutics have had the effective um, development of the neutralizing antibodies. However, on the uh, Brazilian uh, variant, we have seen a clear decline of the development of uh, the neutralizing antibody. And also the mRNA vaccine development here in South Korea, we are also progressing with continued uh, support. And we also have some a survey of 
of the demands um, for uh, these companies. And also, this is in accordance to the first round of the meeting that we have carried out with our panel of experts. And this will be very useful for us to devise a roadmap for Korea to develop mRNA vaccines here in the country. And we have also uh, received 17 uh, surveys uh, from uh, 17 uh, companies have uh, submitted their um, surveys, and they include all of the technologies in relation to the mRNA uh, vaccination production, uh, as for the uh, vector and so forth, and all of these areas need government support and incentives. And based on these uh, surveys, we will be also devising a detailed guidelines by uh, ministries uh, to devise the uh, needs of the support areas. And on the 17th of May, we will be having a, a round of uh, government meetings, and we will also be opening our uh, meetings to a panel of experts as well. And as for the remdesivir, we have been administered uh, the drug to uh, more than 6,500 uh, uh, patients here in the country. And also as for Reginora, we have uh, been administering the drug to about 3,200 uh, patients here in the country as well. And as for uh, the uh, the blood plasma treatment, we are also having the approval of 45 uh, cases um, under uh, the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety. And as for the culture of uh, culturing of the COVID-19 uh, vaccines, uh, COVID-19 uh, um, genes, that is, we are also continuing to uh, carry these out as well. And going forward, we are also having, uh, we have also have had the uh, continued culturing of the new variants, and they have been been uh, also doing across uh, 49 uh, institutions here in South Korea. And as for the Indian new variant, we will be also beginning the process very soon, starting from May. And uh, last but not least, I would like to mention the following. Uh, the COVID-19 vaccine is going to be rolled out in full-fledged. Nevertheless, we believe uh, that despite these vaccine rollout, it is uh, very important uh, that we carry out continued medical responses against these COVID-19 uh, virus, and this is ever more important looking at the cases of India. And we believe uh, that early relaxing of the social distancing measures or having immature uh, medical responses capacity, we cannot fight over the COVID-19 effectively. However, if we have a very stable uh, compliance uh, to the social distancing measures, we believe that we will have the effects of the vaccine to also uh, be proven very soon. And the WHO has said that uh, has mentioned the Indian vaccine as one of the new variants of concern, and we believe that the COVID-19 vaccine new variant, that is, uh, these mutations are a very great threat to the uh, humanity, and they also pose a higher transmissibility and also is more detrimental at as well. However, we have learned during this process, we have the we as clade, we have seen that this was a new uh, this also um, transmitted and uh, mutated into a new uh, G8 strain. And as you um, remember, we have overcome these emergence of new variants with the um, compliance of uh, the social distancing measures. Uh, right now in Korea, we have fewer and less uh, new variants compared to other countries. And in the case of UK, we have seen uh, that they are also dominated by the UK variant. And this UK variant it has a very high transmissibility and high uh, rate of fatalities. However, uh, we also have proven effects of the COVID-19 vaccines and treatment against these UK variants. And there could be going further and more variants uh, going further. And we believe that there could be also a very deadly uh, new, vac new uh, variants uh, going further as well. However, we also uh, see uh, that most of these uh, vaccines uh, most of the viruses could also um, uh, uh, replace uh, other um, strains and other uh, mut mutants as well. And we believe uh, that they can emerge in countries that have weak uh, medical response cap capabilities. Uh, this means uh, that it will also take a significant of time even as for us to uh, acknowledge or identify these new variants. And therefore, it is um, also not impossible uh, to protect ourselves from these new variants 100%. However, 
However, we believe that the response to these new variants uh, is the same with uh, our current um, response to the COVID-19, which is based on social distancing measures. On top of this, if we have the uh, vaccines being rolled out here in the country as soon as possible to get more va people vaccinated, we believe that this would be the optimal um, way to respond to the COVID-19 virus going forward. We need to comply with the quarantine measures and also instead of having great uh, fear against the new variants that may emerge going forward, we believe that it is very important to utilize to earnest the current means that we have at hand, including uh, the vaccination rollout. And also this will also enable us to return to a state of normalcy. We will also exert our best. Right, that was Kwon Junuk with Friday's afternoon briefing. So what did he have to say? Uh, Kwon had some messages regarding the variant cases, especially with the Indian variant recently having been upgraded as a variant of concern by the WHO. Uh, but he did mention that Korea was able to overcome other arrivals of other variants before, and that especially through social distancing. Now, on the vaccination front, uh, Kwon encouraged citizens, in particular the elderly people, to participate in the nation's vaccination campaign. Campaign. Uh, and also beginning May 27th, that's when vaccination for uh, regular citizens in that elderly age group does begin. Uh, there is also going to be a more easier, simplified registration system regarding no-show reservations. Uh, and that will be done through, uh, you know, platforms that many people uh, use here in Korea. Uh, meanwhile, Kwon also said that there has been a decline uh, in um, the fatalities regarding regarding COVID-19 after vaccination started, again, stressing to get vaccinated and uh, cooperate in the vaccination campaign. Right. OK, so thank you very much for that. My pleasure. Right up next, COVID-19, the pandemic in 19 different perspectives. That's the gist of an exhibition here in the capital city. And our Chun Song Chu is there right now. Hello, Song Chu. Good afternoon, Sunny. So Song Chu, tell us about the pictures on display. Yes, so this exhibition features photographs about the COVID-19. So its title is Depiction of Social Distancing, and it displays a powerful collection of 80 works by nine professionals and 10 non-professionals. So altogether, 19 photographers uh, worked on this project. And you get that right, 19 is from the name of the virus, COVID-19. And uh, this exhibition runs until this coming Sunday. It's free for everyone. So I thought you may be interested in, in this exhibition when want to take a last look around uh, the collection before it's too late. So let's step inside. But before that, of course, you have to write down your uh, phone number, the, the entry time, and then also you clean your hand with hand sanitizer and get your body temperature checked using the thermometer provided. And as you can see from the, uh, the sign here, the venue used to be a motel. Uh, back in the days, but it's been renovated and repurposed to hold various exhibitions now. So we're going to go to the second floor. And um, what I want to mention, what I find special about this exhibition is that it displays and it showcases stark realities of COVID-19, how it appended uh, the way people work, live and interact, communicate. Uh, but also uh, it captures and it highlights small moments of our daily lives that we pay, we tend to not pay attention to, and those moments have been captured by ordinary people. So, in, for instance, if you look at the picture over there, obviously you see a father and a son on a merry-go-round, uh, happily enjoying their time there, but obviously they're wearing a mask because of COVID-19. And this ride, merry-go-round, also kind of symbolizes how this COVID-19 pandemic seems to be just going on and on and on with no end in sight. And if you look at other pictures too, here is a picture of just piles of garbage uh, because obviously we had that uh, plastic waste crisis ever since COVID-19 with people doing uh, online shopping and ordering food, delivery food. And here, People all wearing masks on the streets. And here are some of the black and white photos of people wearing masks again. And these are all the moments that we think 
they are normal now, but just a couple of years ago, uh, these moments, these realities were unthinkable, unimaginable. So I feel like this exhibition really offers a visual journey to explore all different kinds of feelings like sadness, despair, anxiety, uncertainty, but also it has a sense of humor, hope, and joy. So now why don't we talk to one of the photographers who uh, contributed their, his works to this exhibition. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining our show. Please come over here. Hi, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. All right, so I learned that you took this picture over here, yes. this pause of garbage. So um, can you explain briefly uh, how you captured this moment? Yes, uh, during the corona pandemic, I tried to document another pandemic, uh, so-called plastic pandemic. Mm -hmm. And thanks to great support by uh, the foundation, Korea Safety Health Environment Foundation, I was able to execute uh, this project, and I do appreciate that. Oh, all right. So what do you want people here to take away from this exhibition or the photos here? Well, um, I think every single person in our society now are confronting uh, enormous pain and agony due to the corona pandemic. And uh, because of that reason, unfortunately, we are not able to uh, afford to sympathize others' pain. Mm -hmm. So I do wish uh, this exhibition uh, would evoke audiences uh, to witness others' pain and sympathize with them to cope with the uh, corona pandemic. All right. Um, thank you so much for your thank answer. You so thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. All right. So I feel like all of the works here are really contributing to the documentation of this unprecedented unprecedented time in history where wearing masks and social distancing have become the new normal. And if you think about it, this is how people in the future are going to look back and see this crisis and understand this pandemic and remember this pandemic. This has been Chun Song Cho reporting live from Chongnogu District and back to Sunny in the studio. All right, Song Cho, as you said, thank you for that visual journey. vaccine for kids between the ages of 12 and 15 are safe, effective, easy, fast, and free. So my hope is that parents will take advantage of the vaccine and get their kids vaccinated. Well, we did even better than that. We actually had higher antibody responses in the 12 to 15 year olds, so that gives us real confidence. Authorities in the U.S. have expanded their public inoculation campaign to include children aged 12 to 15 for the Pfizer vaccine. For more on this, I have Professor Kim moon Gyu from the Department of Pediatrics at Yonsei University, who is also the director of the Global Development Center at the university. Good to see you again, Professor Good Kim. Good afternoon. And I also have Dr. Cecile Cherkinsky from the French National Institute of Health and Medical Research. Pleasure to have you with us, Dr. Cherkinsky. Nice to join you, Sunny. So what brings you to Korea? Private, because I'm <laughs> private reasons, because I'm married to a current lady, and uh, also for exploring potential areas of collaboration between private and public sectors in both countries. I see. It's an exploration. Uh, okay. Measure. All right then, Dr. Shakinsky, what are your thoughts on inoculating children against COVID-19 in hopes of reaching herd immunity? I will tend to be very cautious, and uh, maybe. Today, he is a devil's advocate when it comes to children, because I'm not only a scientist, I'm a father. And a father of uh, three children, one of which is uh, what we call an immunocompromised uh, individual. So I have particular uh, uh, concern on this aspect. I would say that first, from a public health perspective, it will be necessary to immunize children if they are demonstrated to be a major source of uh, SARS-CoV-2 transmission. And if the vaccine do indeed block against transmission. 
so far, the epidemiology tells us that young children uh, have a high likelihood of developing COVID-19, but that's via household contamination. The second aspect is that there's very little evidence of secondary infections from children below 12. So it depends what kind of children we're talking about, below 12 or teenagers. But in the case of young children, like 12 years old and below, the emerging data would, however, say that the current vaccines that we have may block transmission, but we don't know if blocking transmission is long-lasting. Long so far, it's promising, but I would expect that it is not as long-lasting as one would think uh, in comparison with protection against disease. The third aspect is the ethical perspective. There's a balance between risk and benefit in offering a COVID-19 vaccine to children that will offer minimal protection to the kid and maybe not much benefit to the population. So one should weigh out those two aspects. The fourth and very important element, based on the previous one, is the practical impact that uh, would have uh, a new vaccine to be deployed within the childhood immunization program. Okay, this could interfere uh, with such programs and uh, it particularly have a negative impact when those childhood immunization programs have difficulties or become precarious to deploy, especially in developing countries. And finally, we have one important aspect. You refer to herd immunity. The current target of obtaining 65 to 70 percent of the population to achieve uh, uh, herd immunity is, to me, a little bit of an overestimate. And uh, if you exclude young children from uh, mass vaccination, you will have, of course, more vaccine available okay, to immunize those people or those subgroups okay, of people who are at risk, especially elderly people or adults with comorbidities or even children with comorbidities. And you know that the present time that uh, the anticipated shortage of vaccine at the global level is a big issue. And it's further amplified by the fact that we may consider to have to booster, give additional doses. We may consider to have also to produce, this is a big challenge in production, vaccines against variants. And if you add all those uh, elements together, okay, you can see what could be the negative impact of adding a vaccine that, or immunizing a large population of people where the benefit, the direct benefit versus the risk are not sufficiently weighed out and could impact on and could, 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 could be deleterious to the global demand. Right. And, and despite the concerns raised by Dr. Cherkensky, there are some pundits who claim that vaccination, COVID-19 vaccination for children may be important because of the presence of variants that are apparently raising greatly the risk of vaccination, uh, the risk of infection that is among the young. What are your thoughts on this, Professor Kim? We uh, see the data from USA that the uh, uh, age below 20 composes about 20% of the total case in USA and uh, might be possible, uh, there might be some possible uh, reasons that the UK variant is in spreading right now and maybe just the uh, portion of the elderly is decreasing so uh, only the portions of the uh, young children are increasing. Uh, I think they spread throughout the uh, indoor sports activity, but uh, they are not causing community transmissions right now. And Pfizer is waiting for the permission. Uh, I think they got, they got a permission for the age 12 to 15. And uh, Novavag is also preparing about 3,000 uh, phase three trial for 12 to 17 uh, teenagers. Uh, we recently uh, encountered a news from Japan, uh, the area of Osaka, that the, uh, uh, the confirmed cases below the age 20 was about only 10% uh, last year, October, but now it's increased to 18%, so it's increasing. And uh, they think that the Kent variant is the main reason that is spreading right now. If you look at uh, our country, uh, it's only about 11% right now. And uh, if we compare for the data one year ago, it's about 7%. So it was seven, now it's 11. So it increased a small amount, but 
In Korea, there's no fatality uh, in the group age less than 20 since the outbreak of pandemic. So uh, if we say there's no variant in Korea, it's not so concerning right now, but we have to monitor as, uh, uh, this new, for the new outbreak, whether uh, the new variants might cause some changes in the situation. And very briefly speaking, as a speaking within your capacity as a physician mm -hmm. yourself, Professor Kim, what worries you most about COVID-19 infection within children? Uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome uh, due to COVID-19 uh, is the most serious thing. And I think it's less than one out of 1,000 uh, cases. And uh, it's similar to Kawasaki disease and caused by some cytokine storm. And uh, the other thing we have to be cautious is the transmission within the family. And you might have a uh, risk group inside your family, elderly or some immunocompromised uh, kid, and children might spread it to uh, those groups. Uh, for influenza, uh, children are not a super spreader. So, uh, we, but we don't have the information for COVID-19, especially we, if we talk about new variants. So uh, we have to watch and see for this. Right. Dr. Cherkinsky, Pfizer's phase three clinical trials showed, reportedly showed that is, 100% efficacy against COVID-19 in children aged 12 to 15. How do you respond to this finding? 100% well, is uh, usually impossible to achieve. It already indicates that maybe the size of the trial was not sufficient. But leave it, leave that alone. The, the results are still quite exciting and impressive. They are consistent with, with the results that have been uh, obtained in the, the um, uh, 16 to 25 years old children. And so we should not be uh, too demanding. However, there's some caution until we see the detailed uh, data. Uh, that's been relatively few cases. We're talking about 18 cases, all in the placebo group, but out of almost 1,200 children. And we do not know, at least I don't know at that stage, how severe, what is the proportion of severe COVID cases were actually detected in the placebo group. So that's uh, uh, one aspect. The second aspect is uh, that the data in terms of safety have been collected and monitored over a relatively short period of time. You know, we're talking about four weeks after the first dose, and we're talking about two months after the second dose. So let's see what happens when those vaccines okay, are introduced in larger population, in real time, uh, because uh, we will have to, have to rely on very uh, uh, so, uh, strong and reliable pharmacovigilance vigilance systems to monitor the very, very few and very extremely rare cases of uh, uh, c critical disease uh, which Professor Kim mentioned about that, that are occurring at an extremely low rate. So what will happen when those trials are expanding the larger population? Right. And Professor Kim, some pundits believe that vaccination side effects may be more pronounced within children who have relatively more active immune systems. What are your thoughts on this? Well, immune cells of children are not like adults and they are more, they are not exposed to many pathogens. So. Uh, they tend to show a stronger uh, response to a vaccine. And uh, more stronger response might result in higher or stronger side effects. But uh, uh, so we can decrease the dosage uh, if that is necessary. And uh, uh, from the Pfizer study, uh, they showed that the, uh, the age group 12 to 15 showed a higher antibody, antibody titer compared to 16 to 25. So uh, that might be, uh, that might mean that they may have more fever, but uh, children tolerate better than adults. So uh, I think uh, uh, the, uh, we should consider the early adult trial that they give a close attention for exacerbation of uh, disease in the vaccinated people, but uh, it didn't happen in children. And uh, for AstraZeneca and Janssen, uh, they paused the study because uh, they are not sure about the blood clot uh, in children. So uh, uh, if we consider about the routine vaccination in the children, uh, I think they should continue with the routine one. And uh, 
there should be no interruption. And if you have to give the vaccine, uh, we should give at least tw uh, two weeks of interval with the uh, uh, routine schedule. Right. Moving forward, Dr. Cherkensky, what are your prospects on the efficacy of other vaccine candidates, including those based on the adenovirus platform against COVID-19 on children? Already we know that uh, Moderna uh, RNA vaccine uh, has done pretty well, uh, at least in the uh, 16 and over uh, individuals. So I would, uh, I would, I would, I would expect uh, that they would have comparative efficacy to, to if when when the, when tested in the 12 to 16, if it is if they are tested. As regard the other uh, uh, vaccines, I mean, or the ones that utilize a different technology like the adenovirus based vector, and know that Johnson and Johnson is about to initiate a pediatric trials, and uh, uh, I would expect anticipate that those, uh, those vaccines would perform uh, as well. But it all depends, let's say, on what we talk uh, when we talk about efficacy. Again, as I said, if you talk about efficacy, protection against severe disease, I would expect that not only those vaccines would have comparable performance. If we now talk about protection against infection, that is in the nose, the mouth, you know, the main part of the entry, of the virus and its main portal of exit during transmission, that's another issue. And we do not have data, except preliminary for Pfizer and Moderna, and relatively scarce on the AstraZeneca and not on the other uh, uh, candidate vaccines that have been or will soon be uh, approved for emergency use uh, regarding the, the, their effect uh, on, uh, on infection, even in the short term. So the question is still open. Right, we'll still have to think about it then. Yeah. All right, Dr. Shakinsky, thank you very much for your insights. And Professor Kim, as always, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Sunny. Right, nice well, be sure to frequently ventilate indoor spaces and to abide by social distancing and mask wearing within enclosed settings. Have a good weekend. See you on Monday.